third franchise is probably some of the dumbest films that I've ever watched. They're a bit stupid, I won't lie, but at the same time, they're just dumb fun. You turn off your brain, you watch a bunch of people die. It's dumb, and I kind of like it. Like, it's, it's just funny just to see how many, like, ridiculous ways, like, these people think of how to kill another person. Like, there's there's some parts of these films where a person's literally, like, tied to a car being driven through the street. It's, it's, it's funny, okay? <laughs> I won't lie. But, you know, some of these films really do suck. Others are alright. And that's mainly what I'm talking about in today's video. I'm going to be ranking the entire Purge franchise from the first film to the last film. Giving you guys my overall thoughts on each movie. Talking about whether I think they're good, bad, mid, horrible. Um, I don't think any of them are specifically horrible. I think one of them is extremely mid, but, you know, I don't think any really bad. So, let's get into the video. The Purge is a 2013 dystopian horror film directed by James DeMonaco. It introduces a horrifying concept. For one night, each year, all crime, including murder, is legal. Set in the near future, aka the near past, because this was released in 2013, and 2022 is now two years ago, the film explores the impact of the annual event on a seemingly perfect suburban family. It stars Ethan Hawke, and the Purge delves into the dark side of human nature and the consequences of unchecked violence. So, spoilers ahead, and let's get into the video. The film is set in 2022, and the United States is governed by the New Founding Fathers of America, aka the NFFA, aka a bunch of twats. To maintain low crime rates and a thriving economy, the NFFA has instituted the annual Purge, a 12 hour period in which all crime is legal, including murder, and all emergency services are suspended. This event is designed to allow citizens to release their pent up rage and to clean society. It's a dumb idea, I know, but apparently it works since all crime is really low now. And the story focuses on the Sandin family, who live in an absolute gated community, and James Sandin, who's played by Ethan Hawke, is a successful salesman for a high tech company that sells security systems to protect homes during the purge. His wife Mary is a devoted mother and together they have two children, Zoe, a rebellious teenager, and Charlie, who's played by the kid who plays um, the young main character in the Ted show, um, which I noticed on my rewatch of this film yesterday because I've been binging that show again, oh, so good. But yeah, the family appears to be living the American dream, benefited from the wealth generated by James' security business, which has boomed thanks to the purge. However, tension within the family is similar beneath the surface, especially as the annual purge looms. As purge night begins, the family begins locking down, and they have a huge state of the art security system that James and his company provides. The family gathers in the home theatre, watching news coverage and the event, and trying to maintain a sense of normalcy, however, that ain't gonna last for long. The atmosphere is really tense. Zoe is sulking over a recent argument with her boyfriend Henry because her dad despises him because he's 18 and she's like 16, 17, which is like, yeah, shouldn't be doing that, you nonce. And Charlie is questioning the morality of the purge. And as the night progresses, Charlie sees a wounded man, played by Edwin Hodge. He's outside their home, he's screaming for help. He's moved by compassion and Charlie decides to disarm the security system and let the man inside. Much to the horror of the parents, the man only known as Bloody Stranger pleads for refuge, but his arrival quickly escalates their situation. Moments later, a group of masked and heavily armed purges arrives at the Sandins' home. The leader, a polite and well spoken young man, informs the Sandins that the Bloody Stranger is their target. He is described as a pig that deserves to be killed because he killed one of their own, which is just disgusting. They demand that they surrender him, warning that if they do not comply, they will breach the house and kill everyone inside. They have about like an hour, I believe, until their supplies arrive to open the house, and then it's purging time. So they're faced with this terrifying ultimatum. The Sander family is plunged into a moral and physical crisis. James is initially just insisting that they have to just protect themselves and their children by giving up the stranger. However, as the family debates what to do, they are forced to confront their own values and the true nature of the purge. Zoe just cares about her boyfriend who's been killed by James because he tried to kill James because he wouldn't let him nonce on his daughter. 
And Charlie is just really opposed to letting him go back outside because he actually has a soul. Meanwhile, Mary is just torn between her entire family falling apart and she also wants to do what's right. And as the family argues, the stranger disappears. And time is quickly running out and the masked strangers disable the sound security system and they break into the house. What follows is a brutal and tense game of cat and mouse as the family fights for survival and the purges armed with knives, guns, machetes and a sadistic sense of glee hunt the sandals through their own home. James takes up arms. He uses his knowledge of the security system to try and outmaneuver the intruders. The family just instantly splits up and in a series of intense confrontations they manage to kill several of the purges. James in particular goes on a bloody Terminator kill streak and kills like 10 of them on his own. And despite their efforts, James is ultimately wounded in the battle by the polite leader. He isn't very polite, and he kisses him on the forehead before he dies. However, just as they are about to be killed, the Sanders neighbours, led by Grace, arrive and kill the remaining purges. The family initially believes that they've been saved, but it quickly becomes apparent that the neighbours have their own sinister agenda. They're resentful of the Sanders' wealth and success. The neighbours reveal that they've intended to kill them as a part of their own twisted purge ritual. So usually they have like a purge party and they're all invited, but the Sanders decide to sit this one out. Because they were also told that that isn't even going to happen, but it still happens. In a final twist, the bloody stranger reappears and saves the family by overpowering the neighbours. And despite having the chance to kill them, Mary shows mercy. She has them all sit at the dinner table and says that they're going to spend the rest of the night in mother effing peace, which is one of my favourite lines in the movie. Oh, they were going to kill us. It doesn't matter. We are going to play the rest of this night out in mother fucking peace. Like, just the fact that she has just seen her husband die and she still has mercy for these people is great. And, yeah, um, Grayson tries to make a last ditch effort with a gun, but she sees the opportunity and she fails miserably because Mary grabs her head, bashes her into the table, breaks her nose, and then she begins bleeding. And then the purge sirens begin. It signals the end of the purge, the end of the torment, and the end of, well, um, their life without therapy, probably. <laughs> the final scene shows the bloody stranger walking away, leaving the sanders to reflect on what has just happened. And also how it is literally just exposed that anyone can die during the purge, even the wealthy. And yet, yeah, The Purge is a tense and provocative thriller. It uses its high concept premise to explore the thin like line between like civilization and the brutality that could possibly lie within anyone. As they say, people need to release the beast sometimes. Maybe you don't murder people, maybe you just do what like people do on TikTok where they go into the woods and they just bash like sticks. <laughs> no, don't do just, just, just get like boxing gloves and just like get a punching bag or something. I mean, the film's pacing is a bit slow at points, but it is able to build some tension as the Sanders situation becomes increasingly desperate. Ethan Hawke delivers a great performance of Jane Sanden, a man who has profited from the purge but is now forced to face its brutal reality. Hawke's portrayal really captures the inner conflict of a father trying to protect his family while grappling with the moral implications of his own actions. And Lena Healy is really, really good as Mary. Like, she is probably one of my favourite parts of the film. Just the fact that she is able, right at the end, to deliver one final blow to that piece of crap neighbour just made me so happy. And, yeah, I also thought the um, bloody stranger, as he's referred to this, but his actual name is Dante Bishop, um, was one of my favourite characters in this film. And I did enjoy the kids in this film as well. They're actually pretty good actors. I think Max Burkholder, I believe is his name, um, who plays his son, he did a pretty good job, I liked the little robot thing that he had, it reminded me of that like thing from Toy Story, you know, a Sims thing, and yeah, they, they all the supporting cast did a great job, I think the film's most striking element is its social commentary, which the later films would get a bit like, mixed up in like, they focus more on the carnage and just the mayhem rather than the social commentary, but in this first one, this definitely serves as a metaphor for inequality, class division and just the dangers of like, just having everything go to violence, which, yeah, um, you probably shouldn't have a night where anyone can just do whatever they want because you will see the worst in people. I mean, I think we're not like thinking of the obvious scenario that could happen here. Imagine there's someone you don't like at your work or something. You gotta kill them on purge night, then you fail. 
Then the purge sirens happen, I have to go to work with them the next morning. Now, I don't know how awkward that would be. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the another good part in this film is the fact that the wealthy people in the film, the Sandons, are able to fortify themselves against the chaos, while the poor and vulnerable people are left to fend for themselves. Then, they become the targets of the privileged people in this film, and then, when the poorer characters ultimately come across the more privileged people in the film, the privileged people have to help him survive, which I thought was really nice, you know. They are able to come to a standstill. I would have preferred maybe, you know, Mary just says, like, stay here with us. Like, I thought that would have gone well, but I do like where they take Dante's character in the later sequels of this movie. Because I think that he just becomes a great leader, and yeah, um, I'm not going to spoil anything that happens later, but he does become a pseudo-leader for some people. And I will get to those in my later videos for the Purge movies. And yeah, while this definitely is, like, undeniably, like, cool, it also leaves you just wanting a bit more depth. Like, the film touches on some good ideas, but sometimes it opts for some straightforward horror and action over some, like, actual, like, inquiries and, like, philosophical stuff. However, it definitely succeeds in creating a tense atmosphere. Like, it's got some really good performances, and it makes it a really good watch. Ultimately, this movie is a really thought-provoking thriller. It's able to perfectly blend, like, home invasion horror with a dystopian social commentary. It definitely may not be as, like, deeply engaging as a lot of, like, other films, but I do think it's really cool. I give it, like, a 7 out of 10. Ultimately, this stands as a memorable entry in the horror genre, and it lays the groundwork for the franchise that will continue its political commentary and absolute carnage. The Purge Anarchy is a 2014 horror thriller directed by James DeMonaco, and it's the second installment in the Purge franchise. It expands the scope of the first film by taking the audiences out of a single household and into the chaotic streets of Los Angeles during the annual Purge. And the film follows multiple characters from different walks of life as they attempt to survive the terrifying 12 hour period where all crime, including murder, is legal. With a focus on some societal impacts of the purge, the movie delves deeper into the themes of class division, violence and survival. And I think it is probably one of my favourites in the franchise, so let's get into this and spoilers ahead. So the year is 2023 and the United States is governed by the new founding fathers of America, who have instituted the annual purge, a night where all crime is legal for 12 hours and the goal of the purge is to allow all citizens to release their anger and aggression, thus reducing crime rates and unemployment. However, the reality is far darker, as the event is really bad for poor people, and it really affects the vulnerable, who can't afford security measures that provide the wealthy. And the film follows three separate groups of characters whose lives intersect on Purge Night. Eva Sanchez and her daughter Kelly. Eva is working as a waitress who's struggling to make ends meet, and she lives in a rundown apartment in Los Angeles with her teenage daughter and her timely old father Rico. They plan to barricade themselves in their home during the purge. Meanwhile, Shane and Liz, who are a young, estranged marriage couple who find themselves in the wrong place at the wrong time. While out shopping for groceries, they are harassed by a gang of skateboarders, dirt bikers, bunch of other people, and their car mysteriously breaks down, stranding them in the city as the purge begins. There is also Leo Barnes, who is an off-duty police officer probably, because he's named like Sergeant Leo Barnes, so... He's got a personal vendetta on purge night, because Leo's son, Nicholas, was killed by a drunk driver named Warren Grass, who was acquitted due to some technical and legal difficulties. I don't know why I said technical difficulties. Technicalities. And... Yeah, so Leo plans to use this year's Purge Night to exact revenge on him, and he is not going to let anyone stop him. And as the Purge commences, Eva and Callie prepare to honker down in their apartment, where the plans are disrupted when Rico slips out, revealing that he sold himself to a wealthy family to be killed in exchange for money that will go to Eva and Callie. Rico's self-sacrifice is kind of heart-wrenching because he's li you literally just see a shot of him as a bunch of rich pricks around him just hold up a machete and just go down. Like, I hate it. At the same time, Shane and Liz are stranded on the streets as the car breaks down, and they quickly realise that it was tampered with by the same gang that harassed them earlier. They desperately seek shelter, and they are hunted by the same gang as the chaos of the purge night unfolds around them. Leo is heavily armed, and he prepares for his mission of revenge. He sets out to find Warren. However... His path soon crosses with 
other characters leading to some unexpected alliances. Leading to some unexpected alliances. Back in their apartment, Eva and Kelly are horrified to see that some paramilitary forces are gathered in the streets below. Their building superintendent, Diego, attempts to take advantage of the purge by assaulting Eva, but he is gunned down by the paramilitary um, like soldiers, and they break into the apartment, capture Eva and Kelly, and they plan to deliver them to their leader, Big Daddy. <laughs> Bloody hell. I need to calm down these videos, I'll just say the most random things. That is his name in the film, by the way, I'm not just making it up. But yeah, as they are taken away, Leo drives by and he sees the situation happening. And he decides to intervene. He kills the soldiers and wounds Big Daddy, um, and he rescues Eva and Callie. Though this act of kindness, you know, allows him to um, save them, it definitely messes up his original plan. Because the troops are still on their trail, and they now have to flee the scene. While driving through the city, Leo, Eva, and Kelly encounter Shay and Liz, who are hiding in Leo's car after being cornered by the group. They realise they're all in danger, so Leo reluctantly agrees to let them join in, you know? We're all just going to have a little fun party on the purge. We're going to go around trying not to be bloody murdered. But yeah, as the group drives away, Big Daddy tries to fire at them with a bloody machine gun in the, in the, in the back of his van. It's, it's, a, it's a cool van, I won't lie. But their escape is short-lived as Leo's car scene breaks down. I thought it was bulletproof, but apparently not. Now on foot, the group must navigate the dangerous and lawless streets of Los Angeles. So it's pretty much his current day Los Angeles. And they witness some horrific scenes of violence, including government-sanctioned death squads, people being decapitated, a bunch of people being gunned down, and a load of bloodshed. They discover a van surrounded by soldiers who were there to ambush resistant fighters. But they were ambushed by the resistant fighters. So, the group scavenges weapons from the van and continue their journey. As they make their way through the city, the group decides to seek refuge in some tunnels. However, the tunnels are far from safe. They soon encounter a gang of violent purges who have set the tunnels ablaze with pyrotechnics. And a huge bloody scene ensues where Shane is wounded, but they happen to just get away at the last minute. And, yeah, that's good. You know, at least they got away, sure, Shane's about to bloody die, but still. It gets worse. So, apparently they're safe, but it quickly doesn't happen because they try to arrive at Tanya's sister Lorraine's um, house but she murders her in a jealous rage for sleeping with her husband so this forces the group to leave that apartment as well the guards they are bloody safe anyway I mean if I was them I would have just bloody killed um, Lorraine so that you know she's dead all the other people are dead in there anyway just kill her you're safe for the rest of the evening but yeah, after leaving her apartment, the group is captured once again by the same gang. Woohoo. It's revealed that they aren't purging for any personal reasons, but they are kidnapping them to sell for a human hunting ring. That's right, this is pretty much just hostile, but more high-tech. And, um, th th there's no actually fun kills, they're just really trying to shoot people, it's kind of boring. <laughs> But yeah, so the group is transported to a huge bloody like theatre mansion thing where they are auctioned off to upper class purges who bid on them to hunt them down. Honestly, that's a pretty genius marketing strategy, you know? Everything's legal during the purge. I would probably just go out and buy, not, not buy, like take a few DVDs from somewhere, <laughs> if I'm being honest. I don't, I don't really feel like, like committing like violent murders, but that's the genius strategy to make yourself a load of money, okay? <laughs> At least the people in the purge are smart. But yeah, once inside the arena, Leo uses his military training to kill a few of the purges, and he takes some of their weapons and night vision like goggles. But like, uh, this this film is so goofy at some points, but I really like it. He then leads the group into fighting back. They kill several of the attackers. However, Shane is shot and killed during it, and that's not before. The resistance arrives. Woohoo! They're led by Carmelo Johns. And guess who else is here? Yep, it's the original Purger. I guess not the, the original survivor. Dante Bishop. Let's just go with his actual name. So, 
With the night near the end, Leah drives Eva and Kelly to the home of Roy and Graf, the man responsible for his son's death. And despite Eva and Kelly pleading for him to abandon this and just live his life, you know, normally, don't, don't murder someone, he is still intended to kill him. However, after confronting him, he apparently chooses to spare his life, even though he leaves the house covered in blood, so... I don't know who he killed, maybe he killed his wife or something. <laughs> and that wouldn't surprise me, you know. Um, you kill my son, I'll kill your wife. <laughs> Do a little trade. But um, yeah, as Leo exits the house, he is ambushed and shot by Big Daddy, who survived the earlier encounter. And Big Daddy revealed that the NFFA dispatches death squads to increase the body count during the purge. And because of this, um, they have to kill a load of other people. So just as Big Daddy is about to kill Leo, in a surprising act of gratitude, Warren shoots and kills Big Daddy, saving Leo's life. And as Big Daddy's death squad arrives, that's try saying that five times past. I'm not I'm not going to because I can barely speak anyway, because I already speak pretty quick and that makes me stutter all the time, but oh uh, well. But yes, yeah, so just as Big Daddy's death squad arrives arrives just as Big Daddy's death squad arrives, the purge sirens blare, signaling the end of the night, and the squad is forced to just stand down and piss off, um, because any further violence is now illegal, even though they literally work for the government and I doubt they care at all. So yeah, Leo, Eva, Kelly, and Warren are just sort of stood there. <laughs> um, and that's where the film ends. And yeah, The Purge Anarchy is a pretty good step forward for the franchise. It expands the scope and scale of the original film to capture some more of just the utter insanity. And it's got some great acts of like violence in the film. The director definitely succeeds in transforming the series from like a home invasion to a massive survival story. It works really well. And one of the film's strongest assets is Frank Grillo's performance of Leo Barnes. He brings a quiet intensity to the role while balancing the characters in a turmoil of just like, okay, I still have to go kill this guy because he murdered my son, but now I have to protect these idiots. And yeah, Leo's arc is really cool. Like he goes from just utterly despising this guy to literally just letting him live. It's really, really nice to see. The supporting cast also delivers some pretty good performances, more particularly some of our main supporting cast, i.e. Eva and Kelly. They, they, they're pretty cool. I do like Shane and Liz as well, um, though it is kind of sad because they are literally mending their relationship. Then it's just... <laughs> if you get what I mean. And yeah, um, they provide a more human element to the narrative. It makes the horror film more personal and impactful. And sure, this is more visually darker and gritty than the earlier one. It's got some good urban landscape. And it pretty much just shows current day LA, like in all its <laughs> glory. Um, and the film cinematography definitely captures the tension and danger lurking around every corner. It definitely heightens the sense of dread just knowing that literally anyone could be looking out of a window. Anyone could be down hiding in the middle of a street. And then you're all just dead. This is simple enough. Just don't go to LA. Just don't go. Just leave the country during purge night. Like, it, it, it won't be that hard. Just literally just... I swear they're like, I swear LA has got like some sort of like ocean near it, just go near that, get a boat, <laughs> just float away from the US for a little bit then just come back after 12 hours, say you've gone on the fishing trip, I don't bloody know, you know, but yeah ultimately this is a really ambitious film that definitely works at some points but there are some parts that doesn't work as well. It kind of delves a bit too much into the goofiness of The Purge and some of the parts which I don't like about the later sequels is where they just get so dumb and they're so bloody random with the killings that it's just stupid. But I definitely like some of it still. It, it, I like how it expands the franchise while also deepening some of the themes of the franchise as well. It combines some intense action with some thought-provoking social commentary and though it isn't really as much as the horror as the original, I still think it's pretty cool. The film is just really cool at some points, other points as I said it is kind of like mid. But ultimately, this film is a fun and entertaining entry in the series. I give it like a 7 out of 10, but what do you guys think about the film? Let me know in the comments below.
The Purge Election Year is a 2016 political horror film directed by James DeMonaco. It's the third installment in the Purge franchise, and I couldn't think of a better year to release a political horror film than 2016. Jesus Christ. The film takes the concept of the annual Purge to a new level. It intertwines the chaotic night of legalised crime with a heated political battle. And the story centres around the fight to end the Purge, with an intense focus on the struggle between those who profit from it, and those who seek to dismantle it. And I think this is probably one of the better Purge films. I do prefer the Purge sequels to the original. As much as I love the like simple home invasion aspect, I do think some of the sequels really like build upon it in a good way. And this is one of those. So, um, spoilers ahead. Let's get into the... Uh so the movie begins with a flashback to 18 years earlier, where a young Charlie Rome, played by Elizabeth Mitchell, witnesses her family being brutally murdered during an annual purge. This traumatic experience drives her to dedicate her life to ending the purge once and for all. In the present day, Senator Charlie Rowe is run for President of the United States on a platform to abolish the purge, a stance that has gained her significant platform from the public, especially among the poor and disenfranchised. Her campaign threatens the ruling New Founding Fathers of America, aka the NFFA, who see the purge as the essential to their control over the country. The NFFA is led by Minister Edwidge Owens, who views Rowan's political election as a direct threat of their power, which... I mean... Just, just get over yourself if you lose, you lose. In response to Rowan's growing popularity, though, the NFFA makes a crucial change to the rule of the purge. For the first time, governing officials, including Rowan, will not be granted immunity from the purge. This decision is a tightly veiled attempt to eliminate Rome before she can win the election and the NFFA hopes by removing her she and killed during the purge, thus ensuring their continued, like, I guess, power over the US. Meanwhile, Leo Barnes, who survived the events of the purge anarchy, returns as Senator Rome's head of security. And this entire film, I was thinking... Can I just get it on already? You know that. <laughs> okay, so in all honesty, that was my main thought the entire movie because literally every scene that they were in, I was just like going, just kiss already, like just get get it over with. But and they don't do that till like the end of the film, sadly. I had to wait a whole like hour and forty five minutes just to see the one thing that I was open for. But yeah, so uh, <laughs> he's now working as her chief of security, and even though he's probably like twenty years older than her, he is dedicated to keeping her safe during the purge. He devises a plan to secure her in a fortified safe house with a small team of trusted set of personal security. However. He is wary of growing threats against her, and he knows that the NFFA will stop at nothing to see her dead. And as the purge begins, Leo's fears are worsened when he realises that the safe house has been betrayed from within. A team of NFFA mercenaries led by El Danzinger, who are all neo-Nazis, storm the building, killing most of Roan's security team, and Leo narrowly escapes with Roan. They flee into the streets of Washington, D.C., and this is probably one of my favourite settings for a purge film. Just... It just looks so cool. Like they got blood on the Washington Monument for God's sake. That's how. That's how you know um, that this is this purge is going to be different. But yeah, while on the run, Leo and Rome cross paths with Joe Dixon, who is a deli owner, and his friend Marcos, who is also his employee, who works at Joe's store. Joe and Marcos are both armed and prepared to defend Joe's deli during the purge. They decide to help Leo and Roan, and they also insist the help of Lainey, who is a former gangster who now operates a triage van providing medical assistance to purge victims. Pretty much, she's got like some street kid, because she was called like Pequeña Morte or something. And as the group seeks refuge and shows as the group seeks refuge and shows Delhi, it quickly becomes clear that they are not safe because this little brat from earlier who tried to nick a candy bar from um, Joe's store comes back with like all of her mates dressed in like purge masks and stuff with like bloody like swords to saw through the door. <laughs> um, so that's exactly what they do and. They try to they try to get in, and that's exactly what they do. So they then have to run because um, she really wants her candy bar, but they, she is eventually killed, I believe. As the group navigates the perilous streets of DC, they encounter a underground anti-purge resistance led by Dante Bishop, a recurring character from the previous films. And the resistance sees Roan as a symbol of hope and is determined to protect her and make sure that she wins. Dante reveals that the Resistance plans to assassinate the NFFA leadership during the Purge, which would effectively dismantle the organisation and end the Purge for good. 
Roan, however, is extremely torn. While she wants to end the purge, she is adamant against using violence to achieve her goal. She believes that doing so would undermine everything she stands for and it would also make him a martyr. She urges Dante and his followers to focus on ensuring a fair election instead, but they don't give a damn about what she says. They're going to do whatever they want. <laughs> so meanwhile, Minister Owens and the NFFA leaders have gathered in a cathedral to celebrate the purge with a ritualistic ceremony. They have um, pretty much just gathered a bunch of poor people in a heavily guarded church and they begin their twisted sacrifices to purge and purify those who they believe deserve it, I guess, or, I mean, one of the guys looks like he's getting off on it when he kills someone, I won't lie, like, he stabs someone, he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Jesus Christ, but yeah, Leo, Rowan, and Joe, and Marco, Slaney, and all the other people who I can't remember the bloody names of, decide to infiltrate the cathedral to stop the NFFA sadistic ritual to protect Rowan from being captured or killed, and after a tense and bloody battle, they manage to breach the cathedral and disrupt the ceremony. Meanwhile, Earl Danzinger just bloody appears out of nowhere and him and, him and Leo starts having a little fight with a little mini knife and then start having a fist fight. But Leo eventually kills him and ensures Rowan's safety. Inside the cathedral, though, Rowan comes face to face with Minister Owen, who attempts to kill her as a sacrifice to the purge. However, um, all the resistance fighters arrive and it happens like in a giant fight. Then he, then he dies and then woohoo. Then the guy who looked like he was getting off on killing people suddenly appears with a bloody gun and then he's, he's also killed. But not until he kills Joe. Not my man Joe. <laughs> but yeah, with the NFFA leaders in disarray and their ritualistic ceremony where they definitely weren't getting off on killing people exposed, the tides turn against them and the purge ends. Ron survives the night thanks to the effort of Leo, Joe, Marcos and all the other bloody people we can't remember the name of. However, as I said, my man Joe is mortally wounded in the fight to protect Roan. And as he dies, he expresses hope that she will win the election and bring an end to the purge once and for all. And in the days following the purge, Rowan's campaign gains even more support fueled by the public's growing disgust for the NFFA because I mean yeah I probably hate the people who get off from killing people as well. <laughs> I need to stop making these jokes but yeah the Purge election year is just great because it ends with Rowan winning the election and her and Leo kissing finally come on it took, it took like an hour and a half but we finally got there guys even though he's like 20 years older than her, but <laughs> I guess they just don't get to ignore the time jumps and stuff, it, who bloody knows. But yeah, so the Purge election year it is a fitting and pretty good chapter in the Purge franchise, I won't lie. It takes the core concept of the series, one night of legally sunshine violence, along with just everything allowed, and injects it with the potential mix of political intrigue and social commentary. The director, James DeMonaco, continues to build upon the themes of just class, like, disparity and just governmental corruption which he's done throughout the other films and it makes this installment probably the most political charge of the series especially considering the year it came out in and Elizabeth Mitchell delivers a strong performance as Senator Rowan who embodies both the moral centre of the film and also the voice of like opposition to the purge her character is really good and I like the fact that she at least has some experience with the purge for a reason to dislike it rather than just like being like yeah unlike the purge you should vote for me you know, guys, I'm like The Verge. I think you should subscribe to me. But yeah, so... <laughs> it makes her character sympathetic and also really cool throughout the film. And Frank Grillo once again shines as Leo Barnes, whose character has evolved from man seeking vengeance to one who is committed to a higher cause. And they get to kiss. But yeah, it makes their struggle throughout the film pretty cool because it eventually ends on a good note. And the supporting cast definitely adds some good parts to the narrative as well. You've got some standouts from Joe, my man Joe, and the crossfire of the purge was really cool. It's got like Lainey in there who brings a sense of determination to the group because she has like a triage van where she tries to help people. I mean, visually as well, this film is probably like the grittiest one of them all. It's got an atmosphere where it's just like pretty disgusting at some points. Like, the parts where they're just walking down the street and you just see a bunch of people like tied to cars as they're like driving through the street, it's just r r messed up. The action sequences are prom probably some of the most intense of the franchise so far. It definitely kept me on the edge of my seat as I watched it. 
well, not literally, but like, <laughs> you know what I mean? It kept me intrigued. And the film's portrayal of the Purge's excess of horror is really cool. Like, it's got a lot of gore in there, which, as everyone's least favourite gore fan, I really enjoyed. And what makes this really cool is the fact that it's really able to boldly address some real-world issues through the lens of a dystopian future. It definitely doesn't shy away from exploring some of the dark sides of politics, including like voter suppression, manipulation and fear and all of that, and the use of violence as a means of control. Like, the NFFA are pretty much as dictators, and I wouldn't be surprised if they employed some free elections, or as one of my history teachers mistakenly said one time, free erections. Um, I will never forget that day, but yeah. Um, it's also really cool in the fact that it introduces murder tourism, which... Shout out to Hostel, <laughs> I'm never going to stop shouting out that film, I love that film. Once again, um, it's basically just showing a bunch of Europeans coming to America on the purge, getting all dressed up in like some bright bloody outfits, and just going around killing people. Like, There's literally a scene where they're stood over Roan about to kill her in the middle of the street, and they're like, We love America, America is the best effing country in the world, just because they get to kill people. But yeah, um... I think this film is definitely one like the best in the franchise. It definitely has a better narrative than some of the like um, anarchy because I just felt that was a bit dry at some points. It definitely uses the purge as a symbol of societal decay, and it also doesn't shy away from critiquing sh some of like the people in power. And as I said, yeah, a very bold decision to release this in 2016, considering what was going on, but. Yeah, ultimately, I give this film like an 8 out of 10. It's got some of my favourite protagonists. It's got Joe. Love you, Joe. Um, and ultimately, it's one of my favourite in the series. But what do you guys think about this film? Let me know in the comments below if you have seen the film. If you haven't, I do recommend it. The first part is a 2018 dystopian horror film directed by Gerard McMurray. It serves as a prequel to the previous films in the Purge series, and it explores the origins of the annual Purge, showcasing how the United States government initially introduced the idea as a social experiment. And the film is set in a dystopian near future where the newly formed political party, the New Founding Fathers of America, aka the NFFA, rises to power and decides to test the concept of the Purge on a small scale before expanding it nationwide. And I do think that this film has some good elements. I don't think it's anywhere near the best in the franchise, but I think it's pretty cool, so let's get into it. Now, this movie is set in a time of political and social unrest in the United States. The NFFA is a radical political party that is gaining control over the government by promising to restore order and prosperity to the country on brink of collapse. However, the NFFA solution is anything but conventional. To reduce crime rates and manage all of the population, the NFFA proposes the annual event where all crime, including murder, is legal for 12 continuous hours. This event is dubbed the Purge and is marketed as a way to let people release their anger, release the beast and frustrations in a controlled environment. And to test the idea, the NFFA decides to conduct an experiment on Staten Island, New York. The island is isolated from the rest of the country and its residents are offered financial incentives to stay and also to participate in the Purge. Those who choose to leave are free to do so, but many of the poor residents decide to stay as they're motivated by the promise of financial rewards. And the story focuses on several key characters who live on Staten Island. There's Nia, who is a community activist and opposes the purge. She works tirelessly to organise protests and to protect her neighbours from the uncovered chaos. There's Dimitri, who is a local drug kingpin, just an overall like gang dude. He's Nia's ex-boyfriend, and although he's initially, like, indifferent to the Purge, he eventually becomes sort of a central figure in trying to survive the Purge, when everything goes, like, horribly wrong. And then there's Isaiah, who is Nia's younger brother, who is struggling to find his way in the tough environment, and he initially considers participating in the Purge for financial gain, but he soon finds himself caught in the violence. And as the night of the Purge approaches, the other face up surveillance cameras and dispatches teams of social scientists and also military personnel to monitor the event. The residents of the island prepare in different ways. Some fortify their homes, others stay in the church, others go around in armed groups for protection, and few plan to use the night as an opportunity for revenge or personal gain. And then there's Skeletor, who is just an absolute psychopath, <laughs> and he decides that he is just going to absolutely like brutalise and murder people on this night. So, the initial response to the purge is tame. Most residents stay indoors, 
minor few crimes happen, such as looting and etc. like that, but the NFFA is disappointed by the lack of widespread violence. So they decide to intervene. They secretly deploy mercenaries disguised as gang members and ordinary citizens to escalate the violence and create chaos they need to justify the purge and their national policy. The mercenaries, which are equipped with advanced weaponry and technology, begin to ruthlessly hunt down and kill residents. They target low-income communities and also minority groups, and as the violence intensifies, and as the violence intensifies, Dimitri realizes that the purge is not just an experiment, but a deliberate attempt by the NFFA to eliminate poor people and also just like create gang violence, pretty much. <laughs> Dimitri gathers his men and takes up arms to protect his neighborhood from the mercenaries. Meanwhile, Nia and Isaiah are caught in the crossfire, struggling to survive as their community is torn apart. Nia leads a group of survivors to a nearby church, hoping to find refuge, but they are soon attacked by the mercenaries and forced to flee. And as the night progresses, the situation becomes increasingly dire as Dimitri and his men engage in a series of brutal battles with the mercenaries, using their own knowledge of the streets to outmaneuver and, like, outfight all of them. But eventually all of his men are killed when a bunch of drones come overhead and it kills all of them except for him as he is able to be pushed underneath the car. Nia and Isaiah, on the other hand, are forced to survive their own experiences. They are forced to fight for their lives against the mercenaries and all other purges, including Skeletor. And while they're trying to find a safe place to hide until the purge ends, the violence and chaos just keeps going further and further until it's pretty much just a war zone. And as the body count rises, it becomes clear that the NFFA never intended to use the purge to be a simple experiment. Their true goal is to use the purge as a social engineering to eliminate the poor and disenfranchised to create a more manageable society. And as the NFFA leadership brought to the carnage and just absolute like degeneracy with cult detachment, they're satisfied that their plan is working. One of their own, which is this doctor who is played by Art May, um, who I don't remember the name of, I believe. Wait, no, Melissa Tomei. Um, and she's just pretty much like, hey, this ain't cool. So they take her away and they kill her. However, the residents of, the, of you know, Staten Island are just like, you know, this ain't cool. You know, no one really finds it interesting except for the NFFA. Um, they all begin to, like, turn the tide, and Dimitri leads one final assault on the building where the mercenaries are headquartered, which is exactly where Nia and Isaiah and all their other mates are. <laughs> so, this bloke, named General Smiley, and all his other neo-Nazi mates, all go inside of the building, and they will try and kill, like, you know, Nia, Isaiah, and their mates, along with every other person in the building. But then suddenly Dimitri comes out of absolutely bloody nowhere and he just kills all of them and it's really, really sick. But as dawn breaks and the first purge comes to an end, they're all able to survive and they ultimately are just like, you know, wish <laughs> root. <laughs> um, but yeah, the first purge takes the franchise back to its roots. It provides a more grounded approach, sort of, because, you know, it does have the sort of home invasion vibe with the bit in the building. But then the rest of it is just all over the place. You know, it's sort of, like, boring for, like, the first half. Then Skeletor just comes in and just starts, like, absolutely murdering people, like, left, right, and centre. And, sure, you know, there's there's just all the mercenary people, but it's just, a, you know, the typical purge bit. It's just a bit boring. When everyone's just killing left, right, and centre, and it isn't just, like, one dude doing it all, like, you know, it does get a bit boring. Because, like, you know, this is, a t this is like, a night where anyone can do whatever they want. Mate, I'd be going robbing. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be grabbing all the DVDs that I need for my collection, you know? Funko Pops. You know, the important things in life. Not, like, killing people. But yeah, <laughs> so, um, you know, the actors in this movie are pretty good. Like, Scott Davis was pretty good as Nia, and, you know, Dimitri's actor was really good as well, and all the other actors in this film were pretty cool as well. But what about Skeletor? We, we don't give that guy enough, like, credit. He was really good in this movie. And the former portrayal of Staten Island is just a little, little, little island where anything could happen on it, especially during the first Purge. Was really cool, you know, it is cool to see the Purge set on, like, an isolated place where there's not really many ways to get out. And what sets this film apart from the predecessors is that it's willing to, like, tackle the themes of, like, systemic racism, which some of the other films really didn't. 
except this one and the next one, you know, both of these kind of take on racism first hand. The other are just more focused on, like, hey, there's a bunch of poor people, let's go kill them. Like, that's really the main focus of the other movies, except the first one. And yeah, ultimately, The First Purge is a really cool movie. It's pretty thought-provoking as well, you know, it's pretty, like, separate from the other film. In the fact that it isn't bad, but it's also just, like, not very good in the, in the same way. It is, like, getting to the point where The Purge just becomes, like very blatant in its, um, like, societal, like, influences and everything, like, how it's able to, like, try and do, like, social commentary and everything, and, you know, it definitely adds, like, a backstory to the series, which I think was kind of necessary, I, I always wondered how did this all begin, and it definitely focuses on how the origin of the Purge added, like, a load of, like, different, like, conflicting narratives from, like, people who, like, dis despise the idea, people who love the idea, what the people who love the idea will do, um, and ultimately, I think it's a great prequel and has a terrifying villain. Ultimately, I give it like a 7 out of 10. What do you guys think about the first person? Let me know in the comments below if you have seen the movie. If you haven't seen the movie, I do recommend go watching it as it is a pretty good entry in the franchise. <laughs> The Forever Purge, a 2021 horror film directed by Everardo Gout. It's the fifth installment in the Purge franchise, and the film continues to explore the dystopian world where the United States government sanctions an annual event known as The Purge. A 12-hour period during which all crime, including murder, is legal. And in this installment, the chaos of The Purge extends beyond its usual limits of 12 hours to forever. <laughs> yeah, it's in the title of the film. It's ever, it's ever after, as they like to call it in the film, the Ever After Purge, I don't know. Well, they didn't call that the title of the film if they just scream that in the movie, but, oh well. But yeah, um, I think it's kind of cool. I do think it gets a bit ridiculous at times, but, you know, it's the purge. What else can you expect? So, let's get into it. So, the story is set in the near future version of the United States, where the new founding fathers of America have regained power despite public outcry and resistance. The NFFA reinstates the purge after a brief hiatus, and the film focuses on the experiences of two families. The Tucker family who are a wealthy rancher family in Texas and a group of Mexican immigrants who work for them. The main characters include Adela, who is a Mexican immigrant who works um, for a meatpacking plant who fled the cartel um, because she used to like fight them in this like woman group, which is kind of cool. Like, I, I would prefer them to explore that, maybe. You know, maybe like have the purge like, take over the entirety of the US, not just the US, I mean the entirety of America. That would be sick. Then you've got Juan, who is Adela's husband, who works at a ranch, and he's pretty much just working for the Tuckers. Um, he's highly skilled in handling horses, and he's just a pretty cool dude. Then we got Dylan Tucker, who is the son of the Tucker family, and he harbors some prejudice towards immigrants. He's pretty much just a dick. Um, and he is forced to confront his biases as the events unfold. Then you got Dylan's pregnant wife, who I can't remember the name of, Caleb Tucker, who is Dylan's father and head of the family, he respects and values the contributions of his workers, and also Dylan's sister, who I can't remember the name of either, to be honest. I barely remember anyone's names in this film except for like the main three. But yeah, as the purge night begins, tensions are high across the entire country. People either barricade themselves inside, or take to the streets to engage in the violence. The Tucker family, along with their employees, hunker down in their respective places. They plan to wait out the night, and Adela and Juan begin... To be like, <laughs> well, not exactly like, um, like intruded upon, but like, they begin to see like what America's like when the purge happens because they begin to be like more familiar, is what I'm trying to say, with the night of violence as they prepare themselves for a mentally and physically like jarring night, especially with the purge happening. And the night of them, and the night of the purge unfolds with the usual chaos and violence, however. By morning, the violence does not end, as it is supposed to be, you know, just over, you know, 12 hours, oh, we, we've had our fun, you know, we killed everyone we wanted to, let's go back to work, guys. As I've said before, imagine how awkward it would be to, like, kill someone, like, try to kill someone on the purge, and then, like, the day after, you have to go to work with them. I wouldn't even be awake, mate, if I had to stay up till, like, 7 in the morning killing people. I'd be asleep for, like, the next week. But yeah, um, so, 
It does not end because a group of extremists who call themselves the Forever Purges or also the Ever After Purges refuse to stop purging. They believe that the purge should never end and that they should cleanse the country of those who they deem unworthy, including immigrants, minorities and the wealthy elite. So pretty much anyone who the common man doesn't like. And as news of the Forever Purge spreads, the nation is thrown into just unprecedented chaos. The NFFA loses control and the country descends into a state of anarchy. The Purge Anarchy? Yeah? And the Forever Purges begin to target anyone who opposes their ideology, leading to widespread violence and chaos. Adele and Juan quickly realise that they must leave their hiding places to find a way to escape their escalating violence, and they make their way to the Tucker Ranch where they find that the Forever Purges have also targeted the Tucker family. Despite their differences, the Tuckers and also Adela and Juan are forced to band together to survive. However, the group decides to flee to Mexico because basically Mexico and Canada have both opened their borders to anyone who wants to leave the US. Because, you know, they're nice, they, they don't just want to let the entire country burn. But yeah, um, they have pretty much have the next six hours to reach the border, which is not going to be an easy task. As the roads are filled with violent purges and the entire country is in disarray. So the group embarks on a dangerous journey to the Mexican border, facing numerous threats along the way, and they must navigate through a country that has fallen into complete chaos with the forever purges hunting them down at every turn, and as they travel, they encounter other survivors who die along the way, and tensions within the group also rise as Dylan is forced to confront his own prejudice towards Juan and Adela, and he begins to see them in a new light near the end, and he recognises that they are really courageous for actually helping him, and not just leaving him there to die. Um, so, you know, you should probably, like, you know, probably realise he can trust them. And similarly, Juan realises that he can trust the Tuckers, you know, he doesn't really like America. Dylan doesn't really like him. So they both pretty much hate each other for pretty much the same reasons. And, yeah, given their history of, like condescension and like mistrust i can understand why they don't really like dylan but yeah as they get closer to the border the group faces their greatest challenge nazis <laughs> yep once again the purge just loves to throw these guys in there they love a good bit of neo-nazis um so yeah a heavily armed militia of forever purges who have set up a blockade to prevent anyone from escaping to mexico and in a really dumb battle where they're all on cars. The survivors have to fight for their lives using all their skills and resources that they've gathered, aka just Dylan and Juan and Adela, because the, other, the others are pretty much just there. Um, and then the final fight, they eventually just get to uh, Mexico. They get across the border, and they finally have found refuge, and the film ends with the birth of Dylan's child as America burns behind them. Not exactly the happiest ending. And, yeah, it's, it's it's probably one of the, like, weirder Purge movies. I don't think it's the worst one, but it's not exactly the best one either. But, yeah, the film is pretty much just constantly raising the bar for the franchise over and over. It evolves from one night to just forever, you know, forever Purge. <laughs> and, you know, the director definitely makes it feel like a more, like, gritty and, like, raw version of, like, the other film. It's just extremely escalated, which I do enjoy. It makes it feel a lot more, like, immediate and urgent than its predecessor. And the movie's action sequences are just never-ending. Like, you know, forget the forever Purge. This is the forever action sequence. And what sets this film apart is definitely its focus on the consequences of the Purge. Like, you know, the NFFA made this night just so they can profit off of the poor. Now they're getting what they sow, you know. <laughs> like, you, you guys did this. This is what will eventually happen if you, like, just get every single violent person to just go do what they want. They will want to not stop doing it. And the performances in the film are really solid. You know, Tenor Swartha as um, Juan. I don't remember who plays Dylan, but he was pretty... Josh Lucas. Literally just right below that. Um, they were all pretty good. Um, I liked um, Anna de la Roga as well. She was really good as well. And overall, I just like the entire cast in this film. They're all pretty good actors and they all went really well together. The film's social commentary is definitely not the most striking element. It tries to tackle so many different elements head on and just constantly shoving it in your face, which 
in a film like a purge film like it's not exactly the best place to do like this kind of social commentary where you're trying to tackle it all at once because it can get a bit much like the depiction of like america falling apart is one thing then you gotta shove in class race immigration like prejudice everything head on shoving it straight down your throat i feel it was like a bit just um much Ultimately, this film is not the most subtle in the series. It's definitely not the best. It's a hundred percent just ups the ante of like the Purge franchise higher and higher and higher and higher to to levels I never thought possible. Ultimately, I do give this film like a five out of ten. It's not the best, but it's not the worst. The acting isn't too bad, but it's not exactly the most subtle, and it is not really the best way to get your point across when you're just shoving it down your throat um, through the means of like extreme violence. But yeah, ultimately, um, that's my thoughts on The Forever Purge. What do you guys think about the movie? Let me know in the comments below if you have seen the movie. If you haven't seen it, I sort of recommend it if you're doing a marathon of Purge movies like me, but it's not exactly a must-watch movie. And yeah, that's The Purge franchise. It's a weird franchise for sure. I don't think any of them are specifically good. I think don't think any of them are specifically bad. But at the same time, they're all just sort of all over the place. I think the social commentary gets a bit out of hand, specifically in the last one. They just sort of like shove it all down your throat. And it gets a bit too much. But where do all these films rank in my opinion? Well, beginning with what I think is the worst one, which is The Forever Purge. This is just, you know... The Purge amped up to 11, and when the first few films aren't exactly the best, I don't think that's the best idea. It really does just try way too hard to be a bit more edgy than the others, trying to add a bit more of that, like, umph with, like, the Nazis and the, like, like, like what are they called, like, um, like, psychopaths who just try to murder literally anyone they see. It's just, it's just a bit, it's just a bit too much. Then, um, in, like, fourth place, I got the original Purge film. It is nowhere near bad. I give it, like, a 7 out of 10. It isn't the worst, but I do think it is a good starting ground. It doesn't really feel like the Purge at this point because it is really just a home invasion film. And that, at its core, is, you know, just a home invasion film. It, it's really just nothing special. It is what started this franchise, and I will give it that. It is what started this entire franchise. Slightly better than The Purge, though, is The First Purge, not The First Purge movie, The First Purge 2018, the prequel to the whole franchise. I also give this film a 7 out of 10. The social commentary is really well done in this one. I do think that it's able to perfectly encapsulate how people, like, the basically the test subjects of this experiment would feel. They're isolated on this island. They're unable to escape, and it just really sucks that they had to go through that. And then they have to see it every year after this, and it's just ridiculous. And I do love Skeletor as a villain, he's pretty cool. Following that, though, in second place, I have The Purge Anarchy. I also give this a 7 out of 10. It's not particularly bad, but this is the first film where you get to see The Purge on a larger scale. This time in Los Angeles, it's got Leo Barnes, it's got, you know, some other likable characters. The bit with the grandfather always gets me a bit sad. And, yeah, I do think that this is probably uh, one of the better Purge films. However, in my opinion, the best Purge film out of all of them, which I have given an 8 out of 10, is Election Year. It is probably my favourite. It's got my main man, Joe. Love you, Joe. <laughs> and it's just really funny at some points, but at other points it's just a bit, like, ridiculous, which I do love at other times. And it is political when it needs to be political. This isn't too political. It's not just shoving it down your throat like the Forever Purge does. With its, like, just bombarding you with constant, constant social commentary. It's, like, amped up to 11 where it just feels, like, a bit too much. This, in my opinion, felt perfect. It didn't feel, like, overly, like, just shoving it down your throat. It felt, like, the perfect amount. I also love Charlie Roan and Leo Barnes' relationship in this movie, how it eventually culminates in the two of them getting together. I felt that was really well done as well. Ultimately, I do think all of the Purge films aren't good. They are all around the same. I do think some are better than the others, though. And overall, I do love this franchise. It is... Well, it's kind of close to me because the first Purge film was one of my first ever horror movies right alongside... 
bloody scary movie, Hostel and Hutch, and I will never forget that. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it for this video. What do you guys think about the Purse films? Let me know your full ranking in the comments of this video. If you did like the video, subscribe to the channel and like the video. If you are up to see more of these rankings, I do them every time that I review a full franchise. My next big ranking video will be in a few weeks once I have finished all the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. The first video comes out um, in a few days. I'm pretty sure, it, in fact, no, I think it will be out when this video came out. I think it's probably come out like a few days before this video actually, now that I'm thinking about it, but what do you guys think about the Purge movies? Let me know in the comments below. If you're excited to see my review for A Nightmare on Elm Street, I've got a special guest in the video as well, so please go check that out. I'll have that linked at the end of this, but until next time, thank you for watching the video. I do really appreciate it. Bye-bye.